So up till this point, we've been talking about homotopy and things like the fundamental group. So pi one of x is the fundamental group of some space x. And one way to think about the fundamental group, and this fundamental group is just your group of loops up to homotopy, where you think a loop is just like some copy of S1, it's like a circle that's been put into the space, mapped into the space, and you're thinking about it up to homotopy. So when we say something like pi one of S1 is Z, it's, that's just answering the question, how many ways can you map S1, like loops, around S1? And there's Z different ways, because if you have a circle, you can take your S1, a loop, and you can map it around once, or you can map it around, you know, three times or whatever, you can do it for any integer, right? Where positive or negative is just based upon your orientation. Um, if, however, you have something like pi one of S2, we said that is zero because now you're trying to think about loops inside of S2, but S2 is just my two-dimensional sphere here, and whatever loop you might have, you can just shrink it to a point. So it's the same as the constant map. Any loop is homotopic to the constant map. So that guy is trivial. Okay, that's pi one. Now, I'm surprised no one asked up to this point, we have pi one, why is it called pi one? And, and one way to think about why it's called pi one is because we're mapping copies of S1 loops into it, right? These one dimensional loops. But then that suggests that we could also define pi two. So pi two of a space would just be maps of how many ways can we like map spheres into that space up to the appropriate notion of homotopy, right? Up to the appropriate notion of homotopy. Um, so now that you have something like this, you know, try, try to think of the analogy here. Like what is pi one or pi two now, pi two of S2? That's asking how many ways can you map spheres around the sphere? Continuously, these need to be continuous, remember. And, and, and you want them to be distinct up to homotopy. So can anyone give me like, you know, some intuition for this? What, or what your guess is? Like one is you just put the sphere over the whole sphere. One is you can send the whole sphere to a point. And those seem like they're really distinct because if the sphere is around the whole sphere, you can't really pull that down to a point without breaking it open, right? But is there anything else you could do? Yeah, yeah, there's some way of like taking the sphere with like half of the sphere, you wrap around the sphere, and then you kind of like twist it backwards and wrap around again, right? So this is, you know, a little bit hard to visualize, but you can you know, try to think about wrapping the sphere around itself twice in a nice continuous way. And you can do this continuously. Or three times, you take the sphere, and like with a third of it, you kind of wrap around, and then you twist, you go back, and then you come back a third time. And, and then when you convince yourself it's these all distinct, now, you know, there's a proof of this, I'm not gonna give it to you. Maybe if your time, we'll come back to this topic, but it comes out to be Z. It comes out to be Z. Um, it's also the case that if you were to calculate pi two of S1, and you think about mapping spheres into, onto the circle, that there was no interesting way that you can map a sphere onto a circle. I mean, you might try try this, how, how can you, but you know, it's like, if you take the sphere and kind of wrap it around, you just homotope that down to a point. So it turns out this is zero. And try and think of it as maybe not obvious, but there's no, there's no nice way of doing this. We can continue, we can continue to generalize to pi three and so forth, where pi n, you can just think of how many ways, essentially it's counting up to homotopy, of mapping Sn, or in this case S3, into your space X. And um, some things work out the way you may or may not expect. So with um, S1 here, 
my pi 3 of s1 is in fact just 0. My pi 3 of s2, well, I'll come back to that one in a second. My pi 3 of s3 is just z. And in general, this is true. In general, you have pi n of Sn is just C. So this is just, you know, whatever's going on here, there's the analogy of wrapping spheres around itself in higher dimensions. You guys convince yourself of this, but that analogy holds as you move to higher dimensions. If you think back to what would maybe pi 2 be for S3, or what would maybe pi 1 be for S3, well, here it's like, how do you map S1, a, a circle, S1, into, onto S3? And um, this may not be obvious at all, but you can convince yourself something analogous to this happens. You can always pull it down to a point. So, so if it's a lower dimensional sphere instead of a higher dimensional sphere, sphere like an S1 and S2, you can always pull it to a point. So these come out to be trivial. So, so those, these, are all instances of a more general fact that wouldn't take too much to show that if you have pi m of Sn, it will be zero when your m is less than n. That lower dimensional spheres pull to a point in higher dimensional spheres. Okay, so then what remains perhaps kind of interesting are these other cases down here. What about now, what about all of these cases? Ah, I guess I already did it right. What about all of these cases where you have pi m of Sn, but now my m is larger than my n? And, and from these, well, these just do continue to be zero. For S1, they do continue to be zero all the way down. But a surprising discovery that's less than a century old is that this is not zero. There's a special map called the Hopf vibration. So you may hear about this in some other context. That's why I'll list it, the Hopf vibration, which is a way of mapping S3 onto S2 that's not trivial. It's like the, the S3 gets mapped onto the S2. It's, um, you, you should like Google hop vibration and look at this, think about this for a while. Um, it's, it's really, I mean, it's a harder thing about S3 in general, but it, this is why it wasn't until within the last 100 years. I believe this was 1930 or something. This was discovered. So, so you have 1931, I think. So, so this is like a non-trivial map. So this won't be trivial. In fact, this hop vibration becomes a generator for a whole family Z worth of these guys. So it's like, you know, quite counterintuitive. And, and as you keep going, you know, things get stranger. So I kind of ran out of room here, but you could look at pi four of S2, that's also Z. You could look at pi five of S2, that becomes Z ma two. That's like Z ma two Z, the cyclic group of two elements, Z two. And, and you keep going, so like, here's, here's a fun one. Um, 14, pi 14, you know, I'll just cram it in over here, you know, if you did, Right here to make the point. Hi. Pi 14. It's really good stuff. Pi 14 of, of S2 comes out to be this wild group, the cyclic group of 84 elements times um, uh, cr cross the cyclic group of two elements, cross the cyclic group of two elements. So like, it's weird, it's bizarre, okay? So like, this is, this is strange. But not only is it strange, it's also very hard to calculate. So, so we could do this. We could play this game and, and develop homotopy theory. We could talk about, I mean, we're just doing spheres here. These are like the simplest shapes we have. You know, you can think about what it be for torus or for some other shape. But I'm saying just, just for spheres, it becomes really bizarre very quickly. So in, in the book, Algebraic Topology by Hatcher, 
there is a discussion of you know, chapter one, we introduce pi one, the fundamental group, and then he does move to pi two, pi three, and pi four, and saying what we know about it. There's actually quite a bit we don't know about um, homotopy, but there's, there's a fair bit we do, but that's not until chapter four. And he puts it off in chapter four because it's quite computationally messy, right? Like there's just, it's not a clean theory. Um, there are some very nice results in it. Maybe if we have time, we'll get to it at the end of the semester, but, but it's not clean. And so, you know, it's, it's not the preferred way to go. So we want another approach. And so that's what we're gonna do. Approach of chapter two of algebraic topology, which is homology. So instead of, instead of trying to build up this homotopy theory, we're gonna shift gears and talk about homology. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce simplicial homology which is a very simple homology theory. And then what we'll do in the next couple of lectures is we'll build up singular homology, which will be a little bit richer of a homology theory. But hopefully uh, within just one lecture, we'll be able to completely build up simplicial homology and you'll give you some nice intuition of what's going on, which then we'll come back and um, make it a little bit richer with singular homology. Okay, simplicial homology. Simplicial is talking about simplexes. So what do I mean by a simplex? A zero simplex is just a single point. A one simplex or one dimensional simplex is a line. A two simplex will be a triangle and it filled in two dimensional. A three simplex, you want to guess? A tetrahedron, yep. And filled in as well, and so forth to higher dimensions. Um, it may not be clear how you keep generalizing this, right? Like how do you think about four dimensional space? Well, mostly we're gonna be working up to three dimensions anyway, but one way you could generalize this is, um, let's do it here, like in the case of this, well, let's first do the line. This line, you can think of as the set of all points. Um, let's call it points uh, T0, T1, T2, sitting in three-dimensional space, such that the sum of these values, the, the coefficients, comes out to be one, and each of them they're all greater than zero, or greater than or equal to zero. They're all non-negative, at least. So uh, let's draw a little picture of, oh, this should be an R2. It's a one simplex. Okay, so this is fine. What I described to you is actually this two simplex. It's actually this two simplex. The one simplex would just be coordinates T0, T1. It's a one simplex. One simplex lives in R2, where you have the property that T0 plus T1 equals one, and that all of your coordinates are non-negative. So let's just see them like little pictures for this guy. So for this one here, you're in R2. You just care about the non-negative regions. So this is quadrant one. And what does it look like to have the collection of points that sum to one? Well, that's just, this line right here, right? Where one of these points is going to correspond to one zero and then you slowly move to zero one, yeah. How about if you're in R3? In R3, we have now coordinates where it could be like one zero zero or zero one zero or zero zero one or everything that's like any kind of combination of those, you know, one third, one third, one third would also work, or one half, one fourth, one fourth. But you could just begin with those three, like the one at one zero zero, zero one zero, and zero zero one, and then you look at any linear combination of those three points, as long as you keep that all the values are positive, or non-negative at least, 
right? And that recovers your two simplex. And now this is a definition you can generalize, right? So your in n simplex and in simplex, you could construct this way as something living in n plus one dimensional space. Because it's n plus one. that has inside of it, uh, that uh, well, I can satisfy the condition that the sum of my coordinates, these are sometimes called barycentric coordinates, comes out to be one, and they are all non-negative. But, but I don't want you to necessarily keep thinking about these as like living in some higher dimension, like some Rn plus one. I just want you to think dot, line segment, triangle, tetrahedron, right? This is, this is the way I think about it abstractly. Because we won't necessarily always be thinking about it embedded in some other space, showing this is how you could um, define it in general. But just think of these three. Um, often, uh, I'll also want to, and this will become more significant later, uh, assign an orientation. And so in order to like, no, have a convention for orientation, what I'll do is uh, I'll just call this point V. When there are two points, I'll call them something like V0 and V1. Um, and when there are three points, V0, V1, and V2, and I'll just do orientation from the smaller number to the larger. So from zero to one, from zero to two, from one to, to two. And down here, the same thing, you could call this V0, and then here you have V1, and some you know, V2 up here, or if you want to, you can call this V2 down here, and V3, it doesn't really matter. And then you can just have the convention, arrows are gonna go from the smaller to the larger. This will come into play a little bit later. Um, so that was a way of giving orientation to these in a very natural way. Okay, so this is a simplex. Um, simplicial homology deals with simplicial complexes. Where a, simplic a simplicial complex is just a whole bunch of simplexes built together. These are your Legos and build what you can, right? And, and we'll often think about them being path connected and all this kind of good stuff. So, you know, you, you could have your nice tetrahedron down here. And then maybe he's like connected and he's like flying a kite, you know? So this is like your little boy tetra flying his kite and the kite could even have some, you know, like, fancy stuff coming off of it. That's a simplicial complex, nice. I just stuck a bunch of simplices together. Uh, let me be a little more precise about that. So a simplicial complex will have the property that it is a set of simplexes of you know, whatever kinds of dimensions you want of uh, simplexes such that the intersection of any two is either, well, like the intersection of this simplex with this simplex is nothing. So it could be empty. They don't all have to intersect. Or, notice like this simplex and this simplex intersect at a vertex. This simplex and this simplex intersect at a vertex. Okay, that's not super interesting. Let's, let's build another tetrahedron down here to see what else could happen. Ah. This simplex and this simplex intersect in a triangle. Yeah, a, 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 a two simplex. So the th two, three simplices intersect in a, in a two simplex. You could also have two, three simplices. So like I could have another tetrahedron here. A three simplex intersect this other three simplex just along that line. You could do that along a one simplex. Up here, these two intersected in this two simplex, and this three simplex with this three simplex up here intersect in a zero simplex, right? So as long as they intersect in 
or um, in a simplex. But it's a single simplex. A single simplex. What the second condition is ruling out is it's ruling out things like like this. This is bad. Or at least it's not a simplicial complex. It has an identity of its own. It's just not this. It's not a simplicial complex. Because it intersects these two one simplices intersect in two zero simplices, right? If I call this edge, if I call this simplex something like E1 and this simplex something like E2, the intersection of E1 with E2 is, I'll call this like V1 and V2, is the set that comprises both V1 and V2. So it's not a single simplex. It's the set of those two. Can you draw a circle as a simplicial complex? So this, this didn't fly. What would you need to do? Yeah, you, you would need three. You know, if, if I want to make S1 over here, if I want to represent S1 as a simplicial complex, it's not that hard. I just make sure I use three one simplices so that any two of them intersect in a single one simplex. A single zero simplex, a single um, vertex. Is that good? Okay. This restriction actually means like it's, it makes our life quite difficult. If I want to make a torus, if, if I want to draw a representation of a torus as, with, as a simplicial complex, think about like what we typically do. With a torus, I typically have a square where I want to glue one side to the other and the bottom to the top. I want to glue this side to this side. I want to make these like both maybe A and A and glue the bottom, you know, I'll just, I'll just label it. I glue the bottom B to the top. Well, this is not going to fly because that's not a triangle. So you might hope, well, let me just draw another line here. I'll just call this some edge, I don't know, C. And you know, you could have all your various vertices. But you've got a big problem. Because here I have two, two simplices. This guy is like U and this guy is like um, L, upper and lower, as I just gave them names. But what is the intersection of U and L? What does it look like? Well, U and L intersect at C. Right? But they also intersect at A, because that A and that A is the same, they're glued together. So they also intersect at A. But they also intersect at B, that B and that B are glued together. Right? So you might think it's a intersection's a triangle. Actually, it's not even a triangle, it's a little bit different, because this point down here, if this is B, gets glued to this point down here. And this point down here gets glued to this point up here, and that point up there gets glued to this point over here. So these three, four points are actually all the same point. So these three points of this triangle are actually all the same point, V. So what does the intersection actually look like? It's a single point, V, that then has an A and a B and a C. It's a wedge of these circles. That is not a simplex, my friends, right? So, so, you know, it was supposed to just come out to be a single simplex. Instead, we got this wedge of circles. So what do we need to do to make a torus that doesn't intersect in all these bad ways? More yeah, more triangles. Okay, so then you might try to do something like, let's break this up into a, a richer grid. Yeah, let's, let's try this now and break this up into, instead of just doing two triangles, now we're gonna make it eight triangles. And maybe that works. We'll, we'll glue, like, let's call this A to this guy over here, A, and this B to this B, and this C to this C, 
and this d to this d, and this is some line e that's distinct from this line like f, right? And okay, I'm kind of tired of labeling them all, but we could label if we wanted to all these other lines if we wanted to. Um, and then you could check, like, do things now intersect in a single simplex? So, you know, let's, let's just call this region here, like, L for left and this one, R for right. So let's just check that single one. How do L and R intersect? They intersect along A, that's right. So they intersect along the sky A. And they don't, E doesn't intersect with anything, so that's good, he doesn't intersect, E and F don't touch. Uh, this top guy gets glued down here, but that doesn't impact him, really. But there is one problem still, and what's that? Yeah, this vertex, let's see if we get it. This vertex right here, is the vertex V. He is going to get glued to this vertex over here. And... Oh, maybe this is okay. These are all still V. Right here? Yeah, because those two will meet at two different points. Ah, there we go. Yes, yeah, so that L and R are okay, but you're right. If we shift to this L, thank you. Now let's see where they intersect. Um, you say they intersect at two points that are the same. Why is that? Um, the, the point on A and then the point. This F. point? Yeah. So if this is like W and W, ah, and U. Right? Yeah. So L and R both intersect, they intersect in this line A, but then they also intersect. So they intersect at A that connects W to V, but they also intersect at this point U. Oh, right. Right, the, okay, you're right. They intersect at the point U and at the point W. Oh, okay, we sorted it out. There was a problem and we found it. Okay, so it's not a single simplex. They intersect at two points. So it turns out this doesn't work either. It, it doesn't work until you move to breaking this up into a three by three grid and splitting those all in half. So like you can double check for this, that now you've given enough distance between all the squares that like this guy is only going to touch him along one edge. Or you know, which have, you know, him and him only touch along one edge, or him and him only touch along one point. So you can check this, but you need now not just two triangles, but 18 triangles. You need 18 triangles. So that becomes, you know, when you do all the identifications on the sides, that becomes the simplicial complex for the torus. But the whole point of this game was us to simplify calculations. And, and this is not simplifying our calculation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's just strike this condition. We're no longer an honest to God simplicial complex, but instead will be something called a delta complex, which is just a simplicial complex where we allow ourselves to intersect in more ways. So, so a delta complex is generalized the idea of simplicial complex so that things like this is okay. I'm not gonna get into, there's a few other rigorous criteria, but um, it's essentially what you expect. It's just allowing you to do representations like this. So this is gonna be my delta complex for the torus. Yeah, cool, okay. So a small simplification we're gonna make.
So I think the best way to proceed now is I, I want to move to defining my simplicial homology. And it can be a little bit intimidating the first time you see it. So I think I'm going to try to unpack the definition while working a couple examples simultaneously. So, so let's just do a couple quick examples. Um, so let's do, I don't know, some simple spaces. Let's do the disk. Let's do S1. And then let's just do the disk in S1. And then we'll come back and do the torus in, in a few minutes. So, you know, a nice simplicial complex for the disk is just this guy. You know, just filled it. Just this two complex is your disk. And S1, if you want to do an honest to God simplicial complex, you would have three edges. But if we're allowing ourselves to do this a little more general notion of delta complex, then we allow ourselves to get away with, well, two, or even if we wanted to, just one. I mean, you could even just have a single edge, just delta complex bending the rules a little bit. So you can, you know, I'll stick another one on it just to show you how it works, but either complex will end up giving you the same answer at the end. Okay, so how do we do simplicial homology? Step one, I'm going to let delta n of x denote the abelian group that has as its basis, so abelian just means commutative, the commutative group, that has as its basis the um, n simplices of the space x. So let's come over here and think about these. In this case, my delta zero of my disk, which I'll just call D, my delta zero of the disk is the abelian group that has as its basis these three points. We can call them V0, V1, and V2. So that's just a copy of Z3 with the basis V0, V1, V2. You okay with that? So like, like what are elements of this group? Elements of this group are just linear combinations of this basis. That's why it's called the basis. It's generated by these, these guys as the basis of it in the sense that some element, you know, what might an element look like? An element of this group could be something like two copies of V0 minus four copies of V1 plus three copies of V2, right? Or, you know, just a single copy of V0 or a single copy of V0 plus a copy of V2. These are all elements of this group. Good. My delta one here is also a Z3, but its basis will be these edges. So let me give these edges some names. I'll give them some names like, oh, I don't know, uh, edge one, edge two, edge three. Edge one, edge two, edge three. And delta two of D would just be your single two simplex. So if I call this like R for region, there's a single one here. So it just comes out to be Z generated by R. Are you happy with that? Okay, so you help me out. You tell me what's gonna be like down here. What is my, I mean, I'm, I'm really just counting. What is my delta zero of S1 with this particular representation of it? Well, it's just Z2 with, 
I'm going to I'm going to regret not having enough space. So let's do this over here. Here's my S1. I don't want to run out of space here. Maybe what I can do is I can do S1 up here and then I'll have space to do the torus underneath. S1 has, you know, here, what is your like delta two of S1? Well, well, there is no two simplex, this is hollow. So that's trivial. What is your delta one of S1? Well, there's two edges here. Give it some orientation if you like. There are two edges here. So it's Z2 with two edges, um, I'll call them what? Um, e and F, or E1 and E2, but here I'll just call them E and F. And what is your delta zero of S1? Well, there are two vertices, I'll just call them U and V, U and V. Z squared, U and V. Is that cool, happy? So in general, you'll have some SpaceX, and you know, th there might be, I don't know, there might be some delta three of it, I don't know. There might be some delta two. It, it's, you know, you can go as far as you want. At some point they become zero because you get dimensions higher than what you have in your space. But in general, you can define some sequence of these spaces, of these groups. So now we have a bunch of groups. The second thing we do is we're going to define maps between these groups. In particular, I'm going to define the maps delta three, delta two, and delta one, such that these maps are homomorphisms between the groups. And let me show you how I'm going to define these homomorphisms. This delta, I'm gonna think of as being the boundary map. The boundary of a single point is just nothing. But the boundary of a one simplex is going to be, if I call these the points U and V, it's gonna be V minus U. Notice the minus is telling me the direction of the orientation. So it's the head minus the tail is the boundary. The boundary of a two simplex is found, so let me, let me draw all the orientations of all these guys. Um, here I'll just call it like V0, V1, V2, is found with a right hand rule where I take my right hand, I twist around as my fingers move, and I read off from V0 to V1, my twisting is in the same direction as that orientation, so it's a positive copy of this edge, so let me call this edge um, E1. It's a positive copy of the edge E1. From V1 to V2, it's a positive copy because it's in the same twisting as that edge. So it's a positive copy of that edge. But from V0 to V1, I'm going against the orientation. So it's a negative copy of E3. In general, you're just using a right hand rule, and if you're going the same direction of the orientation of the edge, it's a positive copy of that edge, and if you're going the opposite direction, it's a negative copy. Okay with that? And, and you can continue to define this in this way. In general, another way you could think about this is if I had written this 
as um, v0 and v1. This would become v1 minus v0. In general, we say the boundary of some n simplex. So this is a two simplex, but it had three vertices. This is a one simplex, but it's two vertices. An n simplex begins at v0, but goes all the way up to vn. It has n plus one vertices. The boundary is going to give you, so this, I'm just going to emphasize, this is an n simplex. Is an n simplex. This guy here lives inside of delta n of x. What he should give you out is a linear combination of n minus 1 simplices. He should give you out things that live in delta n minus 1 of x. And what it becomes is it's just the linear combination of omitting one at a time. So like if you look what E1 here is, E1 is literally just the simplex V0, V1. E2 is the simplex, well then I omitted V0. I omitted the V0 and a v, V1, V2. And my E3 is the simplex where I omitted V1. V0, so V2. So it's just a linear combination where I had omitted V2, V1, and V0, right? So I want a linear combination of when I omit one of these guys. So I omit some VK. And a hat over it means omit. So by bring a hat, I mean you omit it. So this is like, there'd be a hat over the V2, the V2 is omitted, a hat over the V0, the V0 is omitted, and so forth, up through Vn, where k goes from 0 to n. Well, it's almost that sum, except, this is, so this is getting technical, and in general, you're just, gonna, you're just gonna wrap your hand and just look if it goes the same direction or not, and put your pluses and minuses. But, but here we just want to generalize it so we can define it for any dimension, except we need to indicate when it's plus or when it's minus. So can you think of what's a good convention? Like here, we omitted the two and it was positive. We omitted the zero and it was positive. We omitted the one and it was negative. So what's a good convention? Good, negative one to the k. So that gives you an alternating sum, right? And, and that's, just, you, that's just respect and orientation. What the negative one of the k is doing is recording information about orientation. So you can think about geometrically or you can think about this is what's going on. This is the boundary map defined explicitly where you get a linear combination of n minus one simplices, so it's something that lives in delta n minus one. Okay, this is gonna become a whole lot more concrete when I do it with these definitions, when I do it with these examples. So like, let's look here. What does this boundary map do? Uh, boundary, let's do boundary in blue. What does this boundary map do to E1? to my E1. Well, it's just V1 minus V0. Oh, happy with that? It's just V1 minus V0. What is this boundary map to? So here I'm thinking of some boundary map, which is, I would call it boundary one, I'm just call it the boundary map, but it's the one, I call it one because it's doing the one simplicities. This is the first boundary map. What does it do to E2? It's going to be V2 minus V0 v2 minus v0. And what does this boundary map do to e3? It's just v2 minus v1. Happy? Okay. How about this boundary map? So this is now del2. What is this, what is this boundary map going to do? Well, I'm going to think about this r and just do my right hand rule. So, so there's, like, there's only one thing to keep track of what it does. Like, what does it do to the region R? And what it'll do is it agrees with the orientation of edge one, so it's a positive copy of edge one, 
Plus it agrees with the orientation of edge two, but it disagrees with my orientation of edge, uh, uh, agrees with edge three, but disagrees, goes the opposite direction, the right-hand rule, it's going against the orientation of edge two. So minus edge two plus edge three. So those are my boundary maps. Are we happy? I, I, I said that I want these maps to be homomorphisms. I, I, I just force them to be homomorphisms. So I just construct delta n to be a homomorphism. So uh, you construct delta n um, this to be a, sorry, this is not delta, this is, well, it's like this weird partial symbol, right? But boundary n to be a homomorphism. Homomorphism. Meaning like I know what it does to E1, E2, and E3. So like, in general, I, I just construct it. So like what does it do to X plus Y? Well, it just does whatever it does to X plus whatever it does to Y, right? And if you have some constant here, you know, if you have like some constant like five times X, that constant just comes out front. That's what homomorphisms do, right? So like here, if I wanted to know what does partial one do to like, oh, I don't know, what does it do to this entire loop? E1 plus E2, uh, E1 plus E2, uh, E1 plus E3 minus E2, E1 plus E3 minus E2. That would say, what is the boundary of this entire loop? Because as you go around, you have an E1, an E3, and then a backwards E2. This should just come out to be whatever the boundary does to E1 plus whatever the boundary does to E2 minus whatever the boundary does to E3. Do you have any guesses about what this comes out to be? Well, what should the boundary of a loop be? Well, let's see. The boundary of E1 is V1 minus V0. The boundary of E2 is V2, oops. <clears throat> Ah, this should be a V1, shouldn't it? That that's a V1 right there. No, 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 that's a V0. I'm concerned that one of these is off. Is this inconsistent with this? This is all good? Oh, I'm very worried. Oh. oh, oh, this isn't plus E2. We just said, oh, this is E3. And this is my E2. Th th these are switched here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The answer was gonna be wrong, so I knew something was off. Okay, so E3, uh, what's the, um, what is E3 mapped to? Well, we just said E3 maps to V2 minus V1, minus what is E2 mapped to? E2 maps to V2 minus V0. And now we do a little bit of, of here you have a V1 minus a V1. Here you have a negative V0 plus a V0. Here I have a V2 minus a V2. Notice it comes out to be zero, which makes sense because I just asked what is the boundary of a loop, which would have no boundary. Um, do you want to guess what the boundary of E1 plus E3 comes out to be? Well, just those two endpoints. It would be just the V2 minus V0. So it, like, it's doing geometrically what you want it to. Okay, so these homomorphisms are actually recording a lot of geometric information. Cool, so we have these homomorphisms between groups. What I'll do is I'll um, further introduce the convention that I'm just gonna put a zero on the right-hand side. So this is just the zero map. This is the map that just sends everything. These all get sent to zero. And once I max out the top dimension, my delta three, in this case, would also just be a zero. So I have a zero on this side, which means this is also just the zero map. It's just zero goes to zero. Okay, this is called a chain, a chain complex. And from this chain now, I can give you a definition of homology. So here's my definition of homology. We define 
H n of a space to be, well, one last observation before I define homology. We're almost there. One last observation. I said that the boundary of the region was E1 minus E2 plus E3. And then I looked at what is the boundary of that, and I ended up with zero. So what I actually showed up here is I showed that if I find delta 1 of delta 2 of R, it just so happened to come out to be zero. I claim that in general, delta n, um, I keep calling these deltas, um, this boundary map, two boundary maps composed together on anything comes out to be zero. Okay, so maybe I'll need to come back and further justify this. I mean, like, it, it worked out with this particular example, um, but I claim this is true in general. Um, I mean, you can just see from the definition, it's going to each of these two simplices, it's exactly the argument we just did, will come out to be, you know, this arrangement that then comes out when you do it again to be zero. So like, it works for two simplices. But, you know, I guess what you should do is do a boundary map on this guy, right? And when you do a boundary map on this guy, so, you know, to apply another boundary map. So this was, this was the nth boundary map. Now come along and like do another boundary map to it. And so now you're doing like the n minus one. And, and what you're gonna see is you're going through and you're just removing a second, putting a second hat. But you can get a second power of one. And, and then you just have to like argue from this nice little symmetry argument that everything cancels and you get zero. So, so you should show that this comes out to be zero. This is, this is a nice problem for you to do. So that would be a nice one for you to do in your, in your problem set. But because it comes out to be zero, what that means is that the image of one map, the image of say the nth plus one map is always gonna be contained in the kernel of the next map. Remember, kernel is everything that's sent to zero. And image is everything in the image. So it's just saying everything in the image will get sent to zero. That's another way of saying that. Here I'm doing it with n plus one and n. If, if you prefer, you could do it with um, n minus one and n, same thing. And then it's just saying that the image of the nth map is in the kernel of the nth minus one. This here is in the image of this map. And he gets sent to zero, so he's in the kernel of this map. So this guy was in the image of the second boundary map, but he was also in the kernel of the first because he gets sent to zero. Kernel is the things that get sent to zero. You learn that term in linear algebra, right? The kernel is the things that get sent to zero. So now I can just define my nth homology group to be everything in the kernel of the nth map mod out by everything in the image of the nth plus one. So let's see this in action. Let's come back here to the case of the disk. I want to calculate H0 of the disk. That should be, according to our definition, everything in the kernel of the zeroth boundary map over the image of the first. Well, this kernel is just everything, because this is the zero map, 
right? Like this is a dumb map since everything is zero. So the kernel of this map is literally everything. So, so this guy is just saying it's everything that can be generated by the basis v0, v1, v2. So it's everything that's generated by v0, v1, v2. Everything generated by v0, v1, and v2. It's this whole, it's this whole z3. So I don't know, maybe, I, I don't want to write it like this because I don't want you to think this is, this is like a free group, but this is, this is an abelian group. It's the abelian group where this is the basis of it. But you know, remember, this is abelian. So it's the abelian, it's this abelianization of this group. But then we're going to mod out by everything in the image. So we're going to mod out by all of these relations. So we're modding out by v1 minus v0 is 0. That is, v0 is v1. That's the relation we get here. We mod out by v2 minus v1. We set that equal to 0. So you get v0 is also v2. And this last one is just saying v1 is v2. So what do you actually get here? You just get z. You just get a copy of z. H0 is just z. Let me write that over here. H0 is just z. How about H1 of the disk? So for H1, we're not going to look at this guy. We want to look at the kernel over the image. Um, there we go. The kernel right here. Now we're looking at this first boundary map. This kernel, oh, what's in the kernel? You tell me. Yeah, I mean, this, this might take some like convincing, but it turns out like th this is the only thing in the kernel. And like one way I think of it is like the only way you can combine these guys to have no boundary is just to make the loop, right? Like any linear combination of these two guys. So you, like, there's a formal way to do this and it sucks, but you just solve the system, you know, you just say, you know, we want to find the boundary of so many copies of E1 plus so many copies of E2, plus so many copies of E3, and we want it to equal zero. This is gonna be a system of equations. You know, it's, gonna, it's gonna suck, but I'll just wanna show you, you can do this formally. So then what you get is you get A copies of V1 minus V0, plus B copies of V2 minus V0, plus C copies of v2 minus v1 is zero. And then you like group these. So, so you have, did I do this right? I hope I did this right. So I have a negative a minus b copies of v0 plus, how many v1s do I have here? a copies minus c copies of v1 plus, how many v2s do I have? Um, B copies plus C copies of V2 gives you zero. And so now you have a system of equations. You know that negative A minus B has to be zero. You have, because your V0, V1, V2 are basis. So the only way for us to sum to zero is if the, all your coefficients are zero. A minus C is zero. And B plus C is zero. And then, you know, you're like, oh, so A has to equal C, and B has to be negative C. And then you plug in, you're like, oh, so A has to equal B, ha oh, what's the solution? Oh, let's just do it. So this guy tells me A has to equal C. And then, so this guy down here tells me that B plus C, so B is negative C, so B is negative A. And now I have my solution. It, um, it's going to be my A, B, C, you know, my, my solution set for A, B, C is going to be anything of the form 1, negative 1, 1, that is in copies of that. So the kernel is just any multiple, you know, your kernel of delta 1 is just the set of things that are multiples of E1 minus E2 plus E3. Yes, just like we expected. 
So the kernel is just generated by this guy. It's a Z generated by this guy. And then it's all, you know, all um, copy, in, any number of copies of that guy. Two copies, three copies, negative five copies, all will map to zero. Okay, so my kernel is just generated by a E zero, oh, E one minus E two plus E three. That's my kernel. And then my image, my image, well, it's the exact same thing. It's all multiples of E1 minus E2 plus E3. E1 minus E2 plus E3 is zero. So that's the relation from your image by modding out by the image. So what do you get? You just get zero, you just get the trivial group. So H0, the zeroth homology group of the disk is Z, H1, the first homology group of the disk is zero. I suppose we still have to calculate H2. So let's calculate H2. Let's calculate H2 and I'll just do it right here. What is H2 for the disk? It should be the kernel of del2 divided by the image of del1. Oh, sorry, the image of del3. Okay. Um, that del3 here is just zero. There is no del3 map, it's just zero. So we're not mined out by anything. So really this is just the kernel of del2. What is the kernel of del2? What is the kernel of this map? Well, this map is just Z, and R gets sent to something that's non-zero. So the only thing that's going to get sent to zero is zero copies of R, right? So that kernel is trivial. So H2 is trivial. And anything larger, any N bigger than two, it just, it's just all zeros all the way. So those are all just zero as well. So the homology is completely described by just saying H0 is Z and everything else is zero. Disk is pretty simple in terms of homology. Let's do it for the sphere. Okay, we don't have any we don't have any delta. Th I mean, this is already zero. This is just the zero map. These are the maps we have to think about. And over here, we'll, we'll add a zero. So that's just gonna be a zero map here. It's just a zero map. This is, this is del zero. Okay, so what is this guy? E and F. What is the boundary of E. The boundary of E is just V minus U. What is the boundary of F? U minus V. Yeah? And that's it, everything else is zero. So here we go. Let's calculate H zero of this guy. H zero of the sphere is going to be the kernel of del zero over the image of del one. That kernel, it's the zero map. So the kernel is everything. It's everything generated by your U. It's a abelian group generated by U and V. Remember, we're working with abelian groups here. Plus, not times. Oh, I use my operator to denote that. What's the image? Well, the image are just these relations. So modding out by them, so setting these relations equal to zero, which is just the relation u equals v, which means you just get z. Just a group generated by u or v, they're equivalent to each other in homology. How about h1 of s1? Well, that is the kernel of 
delta 1 over the image of delta 2, but the image of delta 2, del 2, is just a zero map. So this is really, this is just my map is zero, but nothing. So it's just the kernel of del 1. It's the kernel of this guy. What's the kernel of this map? What gets sent to zero? I mean, we could do the same kind of like linear combination algebra if we wanted to, but can you just see it? Yeah, it's just generated by e plus f. It could also be two times e plus f, or you know, six times e plus f, or whatever. But it's just z generated by e plus f. It's just the basis here is just e, e plus f, which makes sense because e plus f gives you a loop, and that's what maps to zero. So your h one is just z, and everything bigger. Yeah. H two or anything bigger just comes out to be well, you know, okay. This is all zeros. Everything is zeros. Just zero. So unlike in homotopy, where like your pi n as n gets big, it's really strange. What was it like? Z mod 84. It was you know, single group of 84 elements. A you know, product with the single group of two elements twice or something. This just cleans out to be zero as you get big. This is why homology is nice. Um, I want to give one or two more examples and run over time. So maybe if you need to slip out, you can. But I think this is an awkward place to stop. And I would like to look at the homology of S2 and the torus, just so we have like a complete recording. And then that'll completely finish this topic of simplicial homology. So maybe I'll just give like one or two more examples, if that's OK. But if you have another class, you can slip out and catch the recording later. OK. So, so let's just make sure we have the hang of this and see some more interesting examples. So we just did S1. Let's do S2. So how can we denote, how can we make S2 a simplicial complex? Well, one way to do it is you can have a two complex on top, a triangle on top, and a triangle on bottom, right? So we're going to glue together two triangles. So you know, here, here it's going to be kind of, not going to be able to see it all, the top of the sphere and the bottom of the sphere, where the top is just some region that I'll call T, and the bottom is some region that I'll call B. Have a good Thanksgiving break. And around and around is this um, where they glue up, the boundary of the two simplex on top, the boundary of the two simplex on bottom. So if it's not clear, you know, your T here, my T here is just, I'm trying to draw, you know, my T looks like this, and it's on top, and it's glued to a B that's on bottom, right? And so let's give these guys some names. Um, let me just call them U, V, W, and I'll call these edges E, F, and G, if that's okay. So now I'm gonna make my chain. So I need to begin over here with my delta zero for S2, my delta one for S2, and my delta two for S2. This is now a Z2. Its basis is the top and the bottom, simplices, T and V. Delta, um, delta one of S2 is a Z3. That's basis is EFG. And delta zero is UVW. So this, that's the basis for this Z3. And, and maybe you guys can help me try to knock this out quickly. This map on the far right just has to be the zero map, likewise with the far left. But what is this map? Well, you can just look and see that the boundary of E, the boundary of E is V minus U. The boundary of F is W minus V. 
And the boundary of G, that's right, is uh, U minus W, right? U minus W. And here, the boundary of T, the boundary of T, remember this is where we do our right hand rule. You just stick, stick your right hand on the, you know, stick your right hand to give you an orientation on the simplex. And you just see, are you going the same direction or the opposite direction? And you see, as you put your right hand on T, you go the same direction as E, F, and G. So the boundary of T is just E plus F plus G. And the boundary del two of the bottom, B, is you put your right hand in the rule. Oh, now we're going the opposite direction. See where I'm bottom? Going the opposite direction. So I'm going to be going um, negative E, negative F, and negative G. Negative E, negative F, and negative G. Okay, I think that's all right. So now let's hash out this homology really fast. H0 of S2 should just be, if this is my, if this is my del zero, it's the, well, the, del, the kernel of that del zero is all of Z. So it's the kernel of del zero, the, bound, the zeroth boundary map over the image of del one. So it's gonna be everything generated by UVW, a billion group of everything generated by UVW with these relations. Where now we're saying these all equal to identity. That's what it means to mod out by something. You set them all equal to identity. So we're setting U equal to V equal to W, which again just comes out to be Z. What is H1 of S2? H1 of S2 is now the kernel of del one over the image of del two. So here is my del one. We we can solve this out with a system of equations if you want to, but like can you just see what the kernel has to be? Yeah, it's exactly the same as before. It's just like. You know, you're gonna need that negative u to cancel off that negative u and that w to cancel off that negative w. And so it's just e plus f plus g. So the kernel is just the group generated by a copy of e plus f plus g. And then it's mined out by these relationships. And so these two give you the same relationship. It's just e plus f is negative g. It's just e plus f is negative g, or, or e plus f plus g is zero. So what does that mean? That just means it's trivial. You just, you just mod it out by exactly what you had left. Your kernel was equal to your image. That's what this is saying. Your kernel and image are equal to each other. So it's equal to zero. Finally, H2 of S2 will be the kernel of del two over the image of del three. Now, this is the zero map. So this image has nothing of note. This, this, this image is a zero, so nothing to worry about. So it's just the kernel of del two. What's the kernel of this map? Can you just see it? What is it? It's just T plus B. It's just a single copy of Z that's generated by T plus B. If I had flipped the orientation, it would be T, T minus B. But here was where the orientation is T plus B gives you a copy of Z. There you go. And anything bigger? Any n bigger than two, this just comes out to be zero. And so homology is detecting the difference between S1 and S2. Here your H1 was Z, here your H2 is Z. Do you wanna make a conjecture about what homology looks like in general for S to the N? You want to make some guess about what your homology in general looks like? So let me, let me call this like HN of, let's say, S to the M. You want to make any guesses? Well, with a little bit of convincing, th this H0 always comes out to be Z. The only time it's not Z is if you have a space that's not path connected. But this, this H0 is just always Z. So you're, you know, he's always just Z. But you wanna make a guess about what else is going on? 
yeah, you just get a copy of z exactly when your m equals n, and then it's zero otherwise. So this is another thing for you to prove in general, right? So you should try to go and like, you know, think about how you would, you know, in general create an Sn out of simplices, out of n simplices. The way you do it is you just create one Sn by gluing together two n simplices along the appropriate boundary. And then once you've done that along the boundaries, and then think about what that means to chain and, you know, try and work this out. But this is exactly where you get. This is exactly where you get. So I think um, I'll just end with one very last example of the torus. And then next time we'll move on from simplicial homology to singular homology. Okay, so here's my torus. That's not gonna do. I need to represent this with some kind of simplicial complex, or at least with a delta complex. Maybe not necessarily a simplicial complex. Oh, that's a two-hole torus. I got carried away. Do you guys want to do the two-hole torus? Oh, you should do that as an assignment. Uh, we're already over time, but so tempted to do it. We've already talked about how to draw this with a delta complex with just two triangles. Simplicial complex you do with 18, but we use a delta complex. The homology works out just the same. Um, with just two triangles. So here there's a single vertex. These all get glued together to the single vertex V. The bottom and top get glued together to the edges A. The left and right get glued together to the edge B. This middle guy I call C. And then I have two regions, you know, call them whatever you want, maybe like um, U and L for upper and lower, right? And, and you can start trying to guess, you know, in your mind what you think the homology is going to come out to be. But here, your delta zero is just going to be a single Z, because it just has basis, a single vertex V. Your delta one has a, B, and C. So that's Z3 with basis A, B, and C. And your delta 2 has two, two simplices, U and L. And everything bigger is 0. This is also the 0 map. So this is the 0 map. So the maps you really want to think about is this map and this map. Okay, uh, where does A get mapped to? A gets mapped to V minus V, which is zero. Where does B get mapped to? B gets mapped to V minus V, V minus V, which is zero. And C gets mapped to V minus V. They all get mapped to zero, so that's actually the zero map. Okay. How about this guy? Where does U get mapped to? Well, let's do our right hand rule. So what is the boundary of U going to be? Yeah, a negative A, a negative B, and a positive C. Negative A, negative B, positive C. What is the boundary of L? Well, now it's A is positive, the B is positive, and the C is negative. A plus B minus C. And then here we go, you ready? You know, here we go. So your um, H zero, you know, this always just comes out to be Z if you have a nice path connected space. But let's just, you know, see it for ourselves. It is the image of, well, this zero map, which is, you know, it's the, it's the um, kernel of this, okay, let's write it down. It's the kernel of del zero over the image of del one. So the kernel of this guy is the whole thing Z, modded out by the image of this, which is zero. So Z modded out by zero, that's just Z, right? What is H1? 
of t. Well, it's the kernel of delta 1 over the image of delta 2. What is the kernel of this map? Well, everything, right? Everything gets sent to zero by the zero map. So the kernel of this map is everything. It's the abelian map with basis A, B, and C. It's your Z3 here. But you get some relations induced here. We get the relation A plus B minus C is zero, which could also be written C is A plus B. That's the induced relation. Meaning that this just kills off one of these guys. So this is the same as just Z2. The abelian group with basis just A and B. Because this guy just kills off that C. It's abelian groups. And then, what is H2 of your torus? Okay, so the kernel of del 2 over the image of del 3. Well, this is just a zero map. So this image doesn't do anything. Just modding out by zero, trivial group. So it's just the kernel of this map. What is the kernel of this map? I mean, we can do the whole you know, argument where we set up a system of equations where we're like, well, when does u plus l map to zero? Like a copies of u plus, maybe not a, m copies of u plus n copies of l, and then you set it up, but what do you find? You see, it's just gonna come out to be u plus l. So it's just a single z generated by a single guy u plus l. Okay. Why is your h1 z2? Can you kind of see what's going on there? Why? It's kind of like almost two like one dimensional loops, or like, like kind of goals that you go on either. Yeah, yeah, so that's corresponding to in your torus, there's like one way to go around that corresponds to like A, and another way of going around corresponds to B. And that corresponds to the Z2 being generated by, like your, by your A and B by A and your B, which is the two ways of going around. And then the Z might be more subtle, but somehow it's like corresponds to the fact that there's like, you know, this, whole, this like higher dimensional hole in here. So as we do more examples, we'll get more intuition for what's going on here. But, but a good exercise I'll leave you with is to do the same for the two-hole torus. Calculate the homology of it. Now, recall, if you go back to maybe the very first lecture in the series, the two-hole torus can be represented by an octagon. Remember this? Where you have your side A, B that you glue with A and B going the opposite way, and then C, D, that you glue with reverse orientation CD. But this is not made up of triangles. So then all you do is you introduce a few more lines, like add a line here, add a line, and just triangulate this guy. Just triangulate him. And in triangulating, we'll need to introduce a few more names for these edges. So maybe I'll call this like E1, this guy like edge two, this guy, edge three, and this guy, edge four. And remember, like the base, this, this vertex down here at the bottom of A gets glued to this vertex at the bottom of A, which is now at the head of B, so it gets glued to this one at the head of A, uh, head of B, which is now at the head of A, so it's glued to this one at the head of A. And, and you keep reasoning this way, he's at the bottom, the base of the, the tail of D, so it's glued to this guy at the tail of D. But then he's at the head of C, so he gets glued to this guy at the head of C. But now he's at the head of D, so he gets glued to this guy at the head of D. So these are actually all the same vertex. Right? So when you start making your chain, I'm not going to do this for you, but you know, when you start making your chain, the delta zero is just a single B. Just Z generated with a single basis, element B. Your um, delta one, Looking at your one complexes, you say you have A, B, C, and D, that's four, plus one, two, three, four, five more, right? I've got to label E5. 
So this, is going, this guy here now becomes a Z9. So when doing the two torus, he's still Z, but he's a Z9. And then this guy, a delta 2, you now have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 regions, so he's a Z6. And then you can do it out. And, you know, like, because these are all the same V, once again, you still have this, just the zero map. So it's not that much different, but this map's a bit more complicated. You gotta keep track of all these different regions. You've got regions here, like region R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, and R6. Okay, well, I've essentially done it for you at this point. You just need to work it out. But that's the picture you can work from and see if you can find what it is. And maybe you can like think like, ah, here your H1 was Z2 because there are kind of like two loops here. How many loops describe the torus? Well, you know, maybe I want like a loop that goes around this way and a loop that goes around this way and a loop that goes around this way and this way. So, so four, so you should get, this should be four. But wait to see what you get for H2. See, and then, you know, then think about a little bit what that is telling you. So we'll, we'll stop there for today.